and the secret weapon, so to speak, that you have, every company in the world is trying to figure out how to be purpose driven, even if they're selling a widget. And as a social impact organization, that is your secret weapon. And you can lean into that, but don't use it as an excuse for lowering the bar on the quality of your communications. Hi, everyone. Tristan McIver here at AMC NPO Solutions. On this episode of The Strategic Nonprofit, we will be talking about how to design communication for social change. I've invited Eric Ressler to join me on the podcast. Eric's passion for design eventually transformed into a love for philanthropy and advocacy. Today, Eric is on a mission to help social impact organizations across the globe navigate a rapidly changing world by helping them perfect their impact story, build brand awareness, and inspire action. Welcome to the strategic nonprofit, Eric. Thanks for having me on today. Please share with our listeners a little more about yourself and your work at Cosmic. Sure. So I'm the founder and creative director at Cosmic, and Cosmic is a social impact creative agency. So we work with organizations trying to move humanity forward in one way or another, and we help them with branding, creating digital experiences, and really how they can help through digital experiences and branding move their missions forward and scale their impact. Our attention is constantly bombarded with information from many social media sources and the like. What is attention economy and can you provide an example for our listeners? Yeah, so the attention economy is this concept that we didn't invent, um, but that we resonate with um, through our work and just observing modern culture. And it's really born, I would say, most pointedly through the mass adoption of the internet and digital channels and mobile devices, I think really accelerated it. But if you think about how we connect and communicate with one another today in 2022, uh, especially in this um, post pandemic phase that we're in, which is kind of a strange word to be using in a misnomer, but that's the term that we seem to be settling on. Um, So much of our knowledge, our communication, our connection with ourselves, our families, our close friends, um, colleagues happens through digital channels. And what's happened through that is as information has become more easily accessible to more people through these digital channels, um, the scarcity is no longer access to information. The scarcity is access to our attention and sustained attention. So I think most listeners will resonate with a feeling of information overload and overwhelm, um, especially on mobile devices and other digital devices that we use to communicate and this kind of feeling of a very noisy environment. And that has all kinds of implications for our lives as individuals, um, in our personal lives and our professional lives. As it relates to social impact organizations and organizations that are trying to reach people to affect change, whether that's a grassroots organization or a smaller set of individuals who are influencers or people in positions of power, what it means is that you have essentially a signal to noise issue. How can you capture people's attention and get your message and your story and your ask across to them in a way that's meaningful and sustained over time? And that's a question that we think about a lot and that really informs the approach to the work that we do with our clients. My hope is there are numerous digital communications that are designed to create change in the real world. What goes into designing communications for social impact and digital activism? So there's a lot that goes into it. Um, And I would say that one of the things that is really fundamental to communications is, is what we would kind of think about as brand building. So establishing a solid foundation and a solid home for those communications. Because when we're thinking about reaching out and interacting with the community. And we use that word pretty broadly to describe just a group of people supporting your cause. And that could be a huge grassroots community. It could be regional, it could be national or international. It could be a small specialized group of stakeholders, but we like this terminology of community because it infers a two-way street and an equal exchange of value and ideas and not, you know, we're just trying to hit people up for donations or ask them to buy things or like ask them to fill out this form so that we can, you know, do X, Y, and Z. And we, we really do frame it around building a brand and building a community. And that has a lot of different elements to it. Um, 
at a high level and kind of a fundamental level, it's about having a really clear set of values that drive your work a clear mission and a clear vision for the organization and what you're doing, because everything really stems from that. The other element that would be really important in the social impact space would be something that would traditionally be called like the theory of change, which is kind of the how, like, what is your theory around how you're actually going to affect change and being really clear about that. And, you know, not in the way where, you know, sometimes theory of change documents look like schematics to like a jet engine or something. And that might be helpful for the internal team. But um, you have to be able to explain it to someone outside of the space in a couple minutes, or it's not really effective as a theory of change. So that would be another like really important pillar. And from there, um, developing a cohesive brand identity from a visual standpoint, your fonts, your colors, your logo, your imagery. Yes, that's all really important. How you show up in the world from a visual standpoint, from a spoken, from a written standpoint, and making sure that's all cohesive. If those fundamental elements aren't strong, um, then communications are essentially built on a house of cards. So we really look at making sure those foundational elements are really strong before we get into building out awareness campaigns or capital campaigns or anything like that. Um, sometimes organizations approach us and those foundations are strong and that's great. And we can just start doing the work on the communication side. But more often than not, uh, especially when folks are coming to us, it's because they need help with some of that foundational work as well. So if you're an organization in this space, thinking about how to um, play in this attention economy, how to build solid communications out, I would just start by looking at those foundations and you know taking a hard look. And do we have a clear mission and vision and values that guide our work that aren't just sitting in a Google Drive folder somewhere, but are actually actionable and embodied by our leadership and our staff at the organization? Do we have a clear visual identity system, a clear way of writing and speaking and articulating our work? Do we have an easily um, understandable theory of change that guides our work? So those are the kind of foundational things. And from there, it really depends on the type of organization, what communications tactics or strategies are going to be most effective. Um, it's pretty common to kind of start to look at things around different channels. So, you know, the biggest, uh, most fundamental way to split this up would be owned, earned, and paid media, right? So owned media would be, mostly your website, but elements that you have complete control over. Um, we see the website really being the hub of everything else and communications really um, should be pointing back to the website as the home base or the, the digital hub for all of your communications. Earned media would be, you know, things like um, getting placements and publications. So PR, um, you know, getting placements on other organizations' websites. So you're earning the trust and the respect of other channels and publications to spread awareness of the brand. So that would be like another pillar. And then paid media is advertising at the end of the day. So whether that's social advertising or, you know, doing placements in a magazine or a trade show or, um, you know, commercial or bumpers on podcasts or whatever it is, that's kind of the third pillar. So we tend to look at communications from those three lenses and try and figure out based on the needs and the goals and the, the trajectory of the organization, where does it make the most sense to invest across those three different pillars and then get more specific from there? The other point I think that might tie these first two questions together a little bit in an important way would be oftentimes organizations aren't thinking about the caliber of the brand and the communications and the format of that in the right way. And when we think about this framing of the attention economy and why I think it's such a powerful way to frame this work is because you have to have empathy for your community and how they are navigating their day-to-day -day lives. And because they're so inundated with information and their attention is so um, hijacked, to be able to break through and, and actually create a meaningful relationship with them, you have to ensure that you're showing up within reason to the same degree as Netflix and Nike and Apple and their communications, not other causes or other charities to use that term. I think that that's um, partly where the problem comes from is that, um, and, and it's there is an unfair advantage that those organizations have with just having lots and lots of resources and teams and budgets that are you know, never going to be met by even some of the largest nonprofits out there, social impact organizations out there. But that 
isn't necessarily an excuse to set your bar lower. And that means you have to get creative and strategic around your communications. And we've seen that work really well, even on small budgets. And it is possible to do. And I do think it starts with um, really respecting your community and creating open dialogues and a give and take and not always just asking, but actually giving as an organization doing social impact work, valuable content to your audience that's either informing them, educating them, creating awareness around issues. Because when you're focused on an issue area as a social impact organization, you are also, you're an expert. Your team is literally made of experts, oftentimes scientists even doing this work. And your community of supporters cares deeply about this issue but they may not be doing this professionally and likely aren't doing this professionally. And so they look at you as an authority, as a, a source of authority and credibility on this issue. And you have an opportunity to educate and inform them on the new challenges, the new opportunities. And so that's really valuable free content that is really engaging for people who care about those issues. And, and the secret weapon, so to speak, that you have every company in the world is trying to figure out how to be purpose driven, even if they're selling a widget. And as a social impact organization, that is your secret weapon and you can lean into that, but don't use it as an excuse for lowering the bar on the quality of your communications. Yeah, no, like you touched on a really great point there, you know, providing value for, for your, you know, your listeners, your community, it's so it's so important, um, and it's just a little a little bit. It could be a, a little um, bit of information about uh, what's happening within your organization, or maybe even you know, depending on the the, the type of charity or that it is, you're giving something back and not just always asking. I think that's exactly. where the you know where uh, there's a disconnect too. It's always ask ask, but but how can we pr provide some value for for them? Yeah, we wrote an article about this quite a while ago that maybe we could link to in the show notes. Um, and we we basically recommend, it's not a hard number, but a, a ratio of about three to one of giving versus asking. And mm -hmm. we've found that ratio to be pretty good across the board. Um, again, it's not like a scientific number or anything. It's just, it feels like that's a good benchmark. And, you know, if you're 3.3 .3 to one or something, don't, you know, don't worry too much about it, right? But the the general idea is that if you look at all of your pieces of communication that are going out to different audiences that you're reaching, you want to see that you're giving out valuable content or opportunities or information at about three times as often as you're asking. And it's not to say that there shouldn't be, you know, a standard kind of like, you know, please support a cause at the bottom of those. But if the purpose of the communication is mostly to ask for money or for time or for action, if it's only asking all the time, that feels like a toxic relationship. If you had a best friend that all they did was ask you for help all the time and support all the time, and they never returned that energy, that would be a toxic relationship. And so you want to think about the way that you communicate as an organization and that you engage your community as an organization as a friendship or a relationship or a, a nurturing approach to a community. Yes, and I have gotten rid of some of those friends. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to give and take, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, I'm not sure if you mean that literally or metaphorically. Oh, I do, but, I do, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I think we've all had to do that in our personal lives, or maybe some of us haven't, but um, I think it's the same. There's organizations that I support uh, in theory with their mission and the work that they're doing, but their communications are so one-sided. I've opted out because it's just, again, back to the signal to noise problem. Um, you know, I'm personally really working on trying to curate my information sources and what I do get information from and the organizations that I support, um, whether or not they're clients or not of ours, it, they do a good job of this. They provide value to me and I support them because I believe in their cause. It, it aligns with my values and the future of the world that I would like to see. And I believe that they're credible, that they're making progress, that they are having an impact, that they're effective as an organization, and that I'm part of something bigger than myself and that they're not looking at me as just a way to, you know, get $10 a month or whatever it is that they're asking me for. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Great point. And I hope a lot of those organizations are listening to this. 
<laughs> getting some great tidbits. <laughs> I think what we've seen is that there's, and I would put this in the same bucket as um, like doom and gloom messaging or negative messaging is that there are short-term benefits. These tactics do work in the short term, yeah. but there are long-term downsides and implications that are often overlooked. Um, and so, you know, every organization is going to need to find their own balance. There's, you know, we don't suggest that organizations whitewash or play down the, the a, a critical point. If there's a really bad piece of news against your issue, if there's a new report coming out on climate that we're even further behind that we thought, like, we're not saying don't talk about that. But if you're using fear-based messaging or doom and gloom messaging as a way to inspire action all the time, that is a form of hijacking and misinformation in a weird way, right? And so, and that also over time will lead to apathy over action. So we advise our organizations to look and to play the long game. And there are times where you need to be negative because there's a negative piece of information that is needed to be shared with your community. There's a time where you need to be aggressive in fundraising and asking, but it needs to be balanced with hope and optimism and with giving back, not just taking. Is there anything I missed that you really wanted to share with our listeners? Yeah, I mean, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think we've we've hit some broad topics that are really important. Um, and I, I think it also just maybe even opens some more questions that folks at these organizations might have around, okay, like I'm on board, but like, how do we actually do it more tactically? Um, we do publish a lot on our website uh, in our insights tab on the site that I would point people to um, that does get a little bit more into the weeds, a little bit more tact tactical about branding and messaging and marketing and fundraising and some of those topics. So I would just point your listeners there. Um, hopefully we can link in the show notes to the, to the insights tab. Um, so, you know, article format, other podcasts like this, um, downloadable guides, white papers, like a good body of content to dig into there. If you're interested in how to really play and win in the attention economy for good. And so I would point people there. We also published uh, a manifesto that kind of outlines some of the core pillars of thought framed around this attention economy concept. So that's another resource to look for. Um, and then I also am totally open to connecting with anyone uh, who's a listener. If they have questions for me and you can just shoot me an email, I'm Eric at designbycosmic.com. E-R-I-C at designbycosmic.com. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for sharing how we can get in touch with you. And it's been really great having you on the podcast today. And to get in touch with me, you can find me on LinkedIn by looking up Trista McIver. And you can reach out to me on our website, amcmposolutions.com, where I'm happy to support organizations with governance training, strategic planning, and bylaw reviews. Take care, everyone. And I hope you'll tune in to the next episode of the Strategic Nonprofit. If you want to take your knowledge, skills, and nonprofit organization to the next level by mastering governance and strategic planning, join AMC's NPO Academy. The link is in the notes.